Ok, pues vamos a darle inicio. Bueno, muy buenos días. Good morning. Uh, I want to greet uh, everybody today for this uh, excellent webinar that we are starting that's called uh, IPv6 provisioning for 10G PON networks. We have an uh, engineer Jose Gregorio Cotua, uh, an old friend who has collaborated with us for many years. He's been, uh, uh, he, he's collaborated on IPv6 courses, events in the campus and other activities. So we are very grateful for all the time you devote to us, uh, Jose. For those of you who don't know him, Jose Gregorio Cotua is um, an engineer at the uh, Simon Bolivar University of Venezuela. He's uh, Venezuelan, but he lives uh, in uh, Chile at the Catholic uh, University in Venezuela. And uh, this, um, he was uh, part of the Network and Telematics Department of the School of Engineering at UCAB. And he's the CEO of the Simeon Company in uh, Chile. And he's an expert on IPv6 and uh, GPON and networks and um, GPON networks. So he's about the best speaker that you can get to uh, offer this webinar on uh, provisioning network provision for um, XGPON networks. Uh, it's a very important topic. I was thinking of GPON, IPv6, and the growth of IPv6 uh, globally, and I think it's partly due to the um, uh, GPON and 10GPON networks. And let me say the following. The perception is that IPv6 uh, provisioning in GPON networks is in uh, mostly possible. You have to be very unfortunate uh, if you have a 10 GPON network where you can't over IPv6. Now, having said this, I want to point out that at least in my humble opinion, not deploying IPv6 in a 10 GPON networks, it, it would be because of lack of will or lack of knowledge. That is, for those of you with us today who really is willing to do this, well, this webinar would be absolutely the best to hear because uh, Jose Gregorio is, explains things so easily that uh, he'll explain any doubts you may have and he will guide you step by step, walking you through uh, this process. Finally, Jose, I'm going to give you a floor, but first let me thank uh, the many participants in the region because today, this is Ash Wednesday, it's uh, uh, tomorrow we are starting the Easter holidays, so thank you for being here. Thank you. Go ahead, Jose. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. Jose, just one more thing. Sorry. It's very important to point this out, my apologies. It's important to point out that there is simultaneous interpretation into Portuguese and English. And re let me remind you that uh, there will be time for questions. If you have any doubts, please write them down in the Q&A space for questions. I'm going to be answering some, and I'm going to be transmitting the others, channeling to Jose Gregorio. So I'll have a part, a theoretical part first, and a hands-on part at the end. Jose, now yes. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar that we put together, together with the LACNIC team. I want to thank LAC team again, LACNIC team for enabling me to be this part of, uh, um, for doing my job, uh, trying to assist the IXPs in uh, Central and South America to move forward in the implementation of IPv6. This is really the idea. Uh, Alejandro's comment is absolutely relevant because in 10 g -Pon, there's really no excuse. Everything is ready. LACNIC has the addresses, the IXPs can demand uh, the addresses. Uh, it's a very simple process. All the GPON equipment is ready for IPv6 setup for IPv4. The, uh, the equipment, the routers, uh, uh, the routing process uh, providers are, are uh, absolutely ready. So 
Today, we'll discuss the processes and the issues that we need to approach to just as with IPv4 to provision IPv6 uh, and in the end, uh, give uh, internet to networks or clients that belong to Tangipon networks. We wanted to focus this to Tangipon to promote this transition by Latin American and Central American IXPs uh, 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 from uh, GPON to TangiPON. But in the end, uh, the configuration is the same, whether it's uh, GPON or TangiPON, or very soon we'll have 40 GPON or 100 GPON. So what are we going to discuss today? Well, the agenda basically states that there are three I divided the course into three big areas or issues. First of all, I'm going to give an introduction to uh, GPON and TangiPON networks, but especially giving you the context. Could you try how people say that they don't see your screen? Could you share it again? Can you see it now? Now, yes. Now, yes. My apologies. That's a Zoom detail. It's a button. A P. So I was talking about the agenda. And uh, let me give you the background uh, of the GPON and 10 GPON networks. And we're going to see the differences uh, in addition to bandwidth. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the philosophy or the big issues that we need to solve in provisioning access networks, but very especially GPON and 10 GPON networks. The second part has to do with IPv6, the two big processes that we're going to need here that are RA and Slack uh, uh, and prefix delegation. So we're going to go through the concepts, what uh, they're all about and what are the technical issues of this, uh, these processes, these protocols. And finally, we're going to give you a demo with uh, one OLT and one Huawei access. And we're going to see what the commands would be. Although there are several ways you can do it, let's use the commands so that you may see how easy it is. So let's start with an introduction to GPON networks. GPON networks are one of the, uh, or, or the GPON technology is one of the many technologies that intend to provide internet to thousands of users through the access network together with other networks that are based on uh, coaxial cables such as um, Doxy or the uh, copper uh, technologies that are getting the obsolete and all the flavors. So GPON technology is an engineering that assumes the use of fiber optic in the network access, but with some uh, unique uh, uh, characteristics that I'm going to discuss. The GPON network can be seen as a point multipoint network, and in a, the center part, we have an element of control, the OLT, the optical line terminator, that is analogous to what we used to have as DVLAN. And in HFC, we had the CMTS. Well, in GPON, it's called the OLT. That's the central active equipment that will control the connection of hundreds and thousands of users connected through an optical distribution network that is point multipoint. So that is what enables you to take the internet signal from the OLT to thousands of users crossing the streets, uh, the urban scenario. So that optical network is based on a multiplexing uh, and optical division uh, scheme using many elements, but the core one is called the splitter. 
and it enables you to take uh, the optical uh, signal from one or many ports to hundreds of thousands of uh, clients and at the client's home, in this case, FGDA, we are going to have a device that is similar to the modem in XDSL, and now it will be called the ONT. That will be the device that receives the optical signal and presents the use of the different interfaces for usage. So when we speak of GPON, we are, we are speaking of this, a point-multipoint network that has active elements as such as OLT and ONT and an optical distribution network. It has some complexities because of what it means to um, implement fibers on the street, but we're going to not going to discuss this now. We're going to discuss some details about this technology. OLT basically will receive the signals, the entire access to the internet in a service port known as an uplink uh, port or an upstream port. They're usually, now they are 10 gigas and now they're even 40 giga to handle all the traffic of uh, thousands of clients that are going to be behind an ONT. Uh, one of the largest OLTs can handle from 1,000 to 30 to 2,000 uh, in, in a single equipment that occupies uh, one fourth of uh, a rack. The port is the GPON. The ONTs have ports, have GPON ports too. They're known as the NNI interface, uh, service interface that enable you to deliver internet services and telephone services and even you know, services in family, in, very, uh, in Wi Fi uh, interfaces and to, to do relay of the television, even. Uh, uh, transmitting analogic or digital uh, signals and it enables it's a technology that uh, enables transmission even 20 kilometers away or 20 to 30 or 40 and even 80 kilometers with some uh, technical details that need adjustment and so you're going to handle from um, just a few clients to thousands of clients far away and at a very fast speed. In the case of GPON, we're going to see in a couple of minutes, we can handle 2.5 gigabit uh, at, in a service port. And in 10 GPON, GPON, we can handle services with an added capacity of 10 uh, gigabits uh, for each so Gipon uses one single thread and that enables you to improve the issue of uh, invest in, investment in the external plant by using only one thread to transmit and to receive signals and that is possible thanks to technology that is known multiplexing. Uh, uh, wavelength multiplexing, and in the case of G upon, they use two lambdas, one lambda to transmit the internet signals in the downstream uh, away from internet to the user, and one lambda to transmit the, the upstream signals, that is, from the client to the internet. So those two lambdas are in the same thread. In the case of GPON, and for 10 GPON, you use two additional lambdas that are different. One of them I know it by heart and, and I'll show you in a couple of slides. And that even allows you in the same fiber to have GPON and 10 GPON signals at the same time, not needing to change the external plant or constructing an external plant for 10 GPON. So that allows uh, a GPON and 10 GPON networks very easily. What I was telling you is possible thanks to the use of uh, optic multiplexers that um, allow to uh, transmit uh, GPON, GPON si signals that are the lambdas that I said. Um, here you have a 1310 and 1490DS, um, and here you have uh, the others, 1270 and uh, 1578. And even introducing lambdas for optical measurements, 
the analog digital lambda. So this is a technology that allows efficient use of the external plant. In our case, you're going to study the 10 G bond and we're only really focusing on this, these two steps of these two lambdas, but perfectly well, the several technologies can coexist on the same fiber. Now to finish this brief GPON overview regarding how traffic is managed in a GPON network, we have to decouple downstream management, uh, downstream traffic management, so from the internet to the subscribers. And separately in another Lambda with a different working scheme, the upstream traffic, so from the subscribers to the internet. So downstream GPON works in a given way and with a scheme called as broadcast with traffic identification and upstream GPON and 10 GPON work with a technique called as DDMA. So access based on time splitting. So GPON can introduce through to the end user very sophisticated techniques regarding quality of service. So we can, with this brief introduction to GPON, we can already outline the main features of this technology, namely the use of fiber, which allows us to have high speed the use of fiber also allows us to reach large distances up to 20 kilometers in principle without affecting the speed. So one at 10 kilometers, one at one kilometer, and one at 25 kilometers with some adjustment will receive the same level of service at speeds that might range from 2.5 gigabits per port for GPON, 10 gigabits per port for 10 GPON, and soon 40 gigabits with several lambdas for 40 GPONs and even more. So this technology will be evolving towards very high speeds. Another important feature of GPON is that it allows in one access unit that has very limited space but with very high technology. There you can manage from a couple of hundreds of subscribers up to 1,000 uh, um, subscribers. One ONT can easily handle 32 subscribers and with some adjustments up to 64,000 subscribers in half of a rack because the way connection takes place and the way the fiber is dealt with on the street with very few threads you can manage thousands and thousands of subscribers. As with other technologies, this was very difficult for space, con due to space constraints and others. So now we're going to keep 10 GPONs. Why have we focused on 10 GPON? Well, this is because this technology, GPON technology, dates back to the early 2000s. It's a standard of 2003, if I'm not mistaken. In 2012, 10GPON was standardized, although this might sound very new. 10GPON is about 10 years old. Now, this technology has evolved, and there are even technologies prior to GPON known as EPON. And then we have GPON with 2.5 gigabits capacity. And today, this is something a bit short. Many ISPs in the region are transitioning towards 10 GPON devices. Now, fortunately, transitions are benefited by the coexistence. And even in one OLT, I can have GPON service and 10 GPON service, and even in the same card and using the same external plant and just doing some very minor tweaks in the users. CP. So this is a technology that went from EPON to GPON, and now we have two standards for 10 GPON, the asymmetrical standard known as XGPON, which in each port has a 10 gigabits sport and a 2.5 up speed 
up to 128 subscribers and symmetric XG pawn, known as XGS pawn, allows to have a 10 gigabit down and up speeds. This technology has allowed us, has allowed many ISPs in the region and also worldwide, can now start offering services not just of one gigabit, but rather services of two gigabits, three gigabits, and four gigabits, and services of even up to 10 gigabits for residential use, of also for corporate use. In the Americas, we already have ISPs that are delivering two gigabit services or four gigabit services, and even 10 gigabits with 10 G pon. And what we have ahead is even more. I estimate that by the end of this decade, commercially speaking, and at level of deployment, we already have the 40 G pon and 100 G pon technology available. And this has was also even standardized back in 2018. So let us keep 10 G pon now because I'm confident that any ISPs that takes a picture of the situation today in Latin America, either has Japan or is advancing towards Japan, and might even already be using the 10 Japan technology. And this is what is up and coming in the coming years so, at, with some ISPs at a faster rate than others. This is why we call this seminar deployment of IPv6. So, IPv6 is essential because this involves broad width, because provisioning thousands and thousands of subscribers is only possible efficiently. And this can guarantee scaling up because of the IP address issue. Because then we have thousands of subscribers who have thousands of IP addresses, not only just one per subscriber, but up to four, five, even 10 for each subscriber. With IPv4, this is very difficult. Now, this would be a brief introduction. At LACNIC, you have many courses on GPON, which are provided online. I encourage you to participate in these courses. These are very well-designed courses that go into more details on the topic of GPON and shortly in 10 GPON. So let us go on to the second topic of today's agenda. So aware of the technical issues of 10 GPON and GPON, now let us see how we understand the provisioning, provisioning process in an access network. You are aware that an ISP network consists of an access network that you have to deal with the subscribers, a transport network, which distributes the distribution geographically all in all the places where SP is, then a core or control network that controls access to the internet and the subscribers. This in terms of bandwidth and the resources and availability and payments. And finally, and applications and services network. This contains all the services, the control of the services, emails, network monitoring, network management, and the business management. So this is what we call the NGN model, access, transport, control, and service. And here we will be focusing on the access network because Access, the access network is the focus we have today because this is the one we have to provide provisioning for. Now, very briefly, I'd like to start reminding you how provisioning takes place in IPv4 because until the transition does not take place, in some cases, there is no option, but until transition to IPv6 only takes place, we will have to deploy, deploy IPv6 together with IPv4. And these are two processes that have to be run, run side by side. So let us have a look at how this has been done with IPv4. So we can also do it on IPv6 now. And let me speak about the challenges we have with IPv6. In IPv4, 
the main design criteria of the provisioning engineering is that commonly the client's network, which is what we have on the left, is based on private addressing, namely IP private addresses, the famous yes, and others. So, and in the access network on the subscriber side, on the CPE, which commonly does the layer three routing activity, we deploy the first, first client NAT. So the client is masked in terms of IP with a CPE. And here we start the first NATing process. Here we deliver DHCP or static addressing the subscriber turns on the device, the ICP, DHCP, and this for the provider just goes up to the WAN interface and the CPE. This is why I put this arrow down here. The CPE somehow separates the client's network uh, from the operator's network. The operator has to reach until the one provisioning stage of the CPE. That inter one interface will depend on the technology involved. This can be a VLAN, it can be provisioned with IP over Ethernet. There are several mechanisms, size static provisioning, DHCP, or also you can have addressing or a PPVOE option. And basically, provisioning of the provider, the VNG, simple provisioning options. Simply, you have to address the one interface for each CPE. Many servers, a PPOE or whatever, so solve the problem. And then you have the bandwidth control issue. And with GPON, this in fact has been solved because all Peter's T does solve this. But with IP addressing, we come up to here. This is quite simple in terms of deployment. But you have the issue of NATing. You do NAT 4.4 here, and on the edge, you have another NAT so that the Clients can use the limited number of IP addresses that you might have. This is another element. So the picture of IP4 provisioning has client in private addressing, deploy in PPOE, and NAT44, and NAT44 on the CP and on the border, which is what we normally call NAT444. You have this down here on the right. So this picture tells us that some of the elements have this appearance, take place like this. Now, let us see at the elements that change with IPv6. In IPv6, the same access network with a CPA unit, EE and the U, CPE unit in the subscriber and the client network that wishes to have access to the internet with computers, smartphones, and Wi-Fi, and so on, in the same way, and also in a transparent way, because all IPv6 projects with a view to the subscribers have to be as transparent as possible. For these subscribers, we have participated in projects where we have transitioned a subscriber network, and normally, Subscribers don't even realize that they're now browsing in IP6. They start realizing realizing this over time. So that are um, mode savvy when they pay, do ping, they realize that they have an IPv6 version. Now, thanks to the work done by LACNIC, people know more and more about IPv6. Users start having a more leading role. So the same picture in IPv6 tells us that as we no have private addressing anymore in IPv6, we don't on RF6, we have local addresses in IPv6, but 
browsing with that is not suggested. So as there is no longer private addressing, as there is no longer NAT in IPv6, this, the idea is that to eliminate the NAT because this solves some issues, but scaling up with many subscribers, this starts to become a big problem. So as you don't have a NAT from the finer use, final user, end user, there must be a public a global addressing. So um, each time uh, of each device, um, uh, a refrigerator, a laptop, a tablet, a server, whatever, an internet of things device, whatever the networks uh, where the customer uh, connects to, there must be a global uh, IPv6 version, one, or, e or even several. That's another issue. And that IP address that that device has, and at a home there may be 10, 20, 50 uh, devices connected easily. Um, the, there needs to be an IPv4 address uh, that is private as we've seen, and now there will be an IPv6 uh, address uh, and that is responsibility of the provider. So the IP will belong to the provider. So now the provider has a re is responsible for um, addressing to the very last device of the end user. And now the arrow that used to be up to here, now it's up to here. So we need to reach to the IPv6 addressing of the entire network. That's the huge challenge that we have in IPv6. And we also need to do need to do what we did in the past. We need to continue to provision interface one in um, IPv6, uh, the WAP that continues to be HTTP OE or static. There are other new mechanisms that are added. So we need to do what we used to do in the past, but now we have to do something else. That is a challenge. That is that is why in in this course, in this webinar, we are here. So let's uh, put this in black and white. In IPv6, there is no private addressing. There is no NAT. All the addressing is GUA type, GUA, and all the addressing it is suggested to be uh, purely slash 64, a bit more technical in my view. This is a matter of debate, but we need to leave behind that famous issue of the subnetting or dividing slash 120, 124. That doesn't make any sense in my view, because in IPv6, the IP addresses won't be depleted in 200 years. So we have to be bored about it. But that's an issue that uh, is uh, um, needs to be um, understood so the challenge we have is how do we assign and remember that the core element in an access network is that we are talking of mass uh, networks it's not 10 20 50 2000 users think of a g pond network for a great operator in a city for instance i've worked in some projects for instance, in Argentina, I remember that an operator, I won't uh, name them, but they had several million uh, clients in just in Buenos Aires. So when you're thinking of a, a provisioning strategy, you, ha you, you have to think of millions, think of China, think of Europe and cities that have million users. How do we provision each device automatically centralized the GUA addressing of uh, the uh, networks. That's a challenge. So we're going to see that although it seems complicated, it's rather simple. Thanks to the work of many, many people of IETF and all the people on earth that work on IPv6 and that have developed the protocols and the mechanisms for all of this to be possible already. Now, in the case of IPv6, 
let me go back one slide because it's not just address it's not just to route the devices that that's a core thing but it, that's not enough that uh, that uh, addressing needs to be routed it is like it's, if i told you well use this ip address but if it's not routed you can't reach it so you won't be able to do anything with it so all the addressing needs to be routed for it to reach the internet and for the internet to reach that so these are two big challenges and in a way they are summarized here that is why here it says and after signing that address how do we en route it to and from the internet ipv6 so this course responds this question the, uh, the question posed by this paragraph that's what we're going to see so and then very specifically how do we assign ipv6 to the one um uh, to the one of the cpe the one interface and how do we integrate the provisioning with the mechan with the, with the transition mechanisms implemented that's another thing that we're going to address fortunately this topic has advanced quite a lot the cpe units today have transition mechanism support some of them including How do you call this transition mechanism? The dual stack light, the dual, dual stack light, the data center. Alejandro, I can't think of the transition mechanisms. I'm in the pilot mode. 464 is flat. Yes, but there's another one that has a lot of support at CPE level. The DC light. Yes. So let me share something interesting that's very useful for all of the participants. Now in the chat, I'm going to share that in LACNIC, this is a work that we did two years in a row based uh, on uh, somebody from Argentina. There was a very interesting work that is CPE boxes of different vendors with different uh, firmware um versions and what uh, mechanisms transition mechanisms we use it's very useful for the isps here because based on that you can make uh key decisions in your networks yes the one that i've seen that's a very important word because it, it's uh it uh shows several issues the one that i've seen implemented more frequently is the dual dual stack light and one that is being supported by your CPEs, but they still lack, is the 464 in Slack. So that's another issue, but it's another issue that needs to be solved, but after solving the key thing, that is what I just pointed out. So what I just described, this problem and this challenge and these solutions, because it's, it's already been, uh, uh solved we just need to acknowledge it exists for all the access networks so this you're going to have to solve whether you have an xl uh, or gpon in a network in the case of gpon gpon has several ways of working several scenarios fmcdh for instance one for corporate that is the fttv fttc and so on but given that the two active elements that are ont and olt can work both in uh, layer two in the past the, they were a bridge uh, but now almost all of them are cpes layer three they can also work on layer three uh, layer two but mostly they're used in layer three but olt let me tell you is a device it's an active element that not only has uh, layer two features but also layer three uh features so in some cases you can put uh, it 
routing it up and even do relay HTTP or act as a proxy of neighbor discovery. There's a lot of things of layer three. So depending on how you design your network, the provisioning may change a bit, but in general terms, the same challenge remains and almost the same solutions with some variance in design, such as the size of the prefix, etc. So in the case of GPON, 99% of the scenarios, the OLT is layer two, or, or it is configured in order for it to work as layer two. You turn off the layer three, you only leave it for management and uh, etc. And the OLT operates in layer three. That means that provision goes up from the provider directly because the OLT is transparent. It doesn't intervene in the provisioning process unless it relay. That is a different case. You could we, we could organize a webinar just for that. What I mean is that provisioning goes from here when I have the mouse to here. So the GPUN network is sort of transparent for trans for provisioning. However, in the RAS or the, or the provisioning servers, the OLT can intervene because although it is transparent, it may have a level of intervention, for instance, including among the HTTP um, options, elements of information so that the control system may know in what G pawn port or what is where it needs to be located physically because the control system assigns and controls just a triple A with the authorization and a triple A based on the position of uh, the client. So the OLT intervenes, adding the HTTP uh, request, adding information of uh, what card, what slot, what port uh, uh, is. Uh, the one that is requesting uh, located. So uh, this here on top of this is a control system that provisions what is underneath. So this is the sketch of how the oper network operates. So what are we going to remain with? In IPv6, we have two big challenges, putting it in black and white. So we need to provision in, in this webinar, I won't discuss the IPv4 provisioning because of a lack of time, because I'm sure many of you already know how to do it. We won't have the time to do that. We're going to go directly to an IPv6 scenario uh, even more. If if you could implement a GPON network in an IPv6 only uh, setting, that would be wonderful. We've done it in several ISPs in Latin America and the results would have very good, especially because most hotels, uh, the content providers already have their IPv6 good quality. So process one, IPv6 provisioning of interface uh, one, of, and so we have this um, interface. We need to say that in IPv6, the, C, the fact that the CPE has, I'm going to say it slowly because this is important. In IPv6, the fact that the CPE has GUA addressing in interface one is, in the one interface is optional. It is not strictly necessary. In IPv4, it is because it needs to have an IP to do the NAT, but in IPv6, it's not necessary. However, if you wish to give them an IPv6 to one, so that with that, uh, uh, you will do R069, SNMP, SSH, Ethernet. SSH, Agapin, etc. Perfectamente, usted le va a poner una IPv6. So, in these cases, you, you, you put an IPv6 on the one. Now, why is this necessary? Well, you know, IPv6 has a big advantage, namely that the devices can perfectly well do routing using the link local addresses. 
So when this device receives a packet from the LAN network, it is routed towards the next destination using the local address. And even if you put the IGP protocols, like IVGP, then routing will be from link local. Now, let me show you nevertheless how this addressing takes place. But in IPv6, this is optional. And I even invite you that if you do a lab on this, not to put IPv6 to the one, and you will see that even so, you can have internet back here without this having a GUA internet. And it's quite interesting to this to do this in order to discover and validate how IPv6 works. Now, the second process, which is a new process, the new thing in IPv6 that you don't have an IP for, I'm going to read this out. This is IPv6 provisioning of the LAN network or LAN networks of the CPE router of the client's network. So normally, we imagine the client simpler than what the client is, in fact. We say the clients connect to the Wi-Fi, they have a LAN network, and they connect to devices. Now, in IPv6, the invitation is different. And if you read the LACNIX regulatory framework, you see, you view the client as someone who can have a very big network. So that is what we have here. If the client decides to set up a network consisting of several LANs and VLANs, 200, 300, 400 VLANs, and you want to give addressing to each of the VLANs in IPv6, then in that case, that should be possible. Now, if the client wishes to include a slash 64 to each device, then this must be possible. That is why in IPv6, provisioning of the client should be done thinking that you have surplus IPs, but also slash 64 prefixes so that the client can do whatever the client wishes. Don't view the client as the client who connects just one device. You have to view the, view the client as a client who wishes to connect 10, 100, thousands, hundreds of thousands IPv6 networks, if at all possible. So there's nothing wrong if you think of it in that way. You will even do better in the future if you think with that rationale. And this is, of course, contaminated with my opinion. Now, the spirit of each person you consult, at least at LACNIC, will tell you, think that you have surplus of everything, particularly with addressing in IPv6. So I will now go slower so you fully understand the two processes, because the technical aspects, then I might forget the command or something. Now, I always remind, like to recommend to be clear as to what we'll do, namely to do addressing to the one interface and to that the prefixes I assign should be routed. I should be able to route to route in these and also to DNS servers. DNS is also very important in IPv6 because I not only have to provide this in IPv4, I also have to do so in IPv6, and these DNSs have to reach the land side of the clients. So we have to see how I can propagate that until over there, not only to the CPA. So I have four think important things to do, and I will summarize now. To address, do addressing with interface one, to do prefixes to the land networks of the clients, DNS, NTPs, which are also very important, and to do prefix addressing. So we are aware of the challenge then. Now let us go into the IPv6 topic in order to land the technical and practical aspects. Let us very briefly look at the IPv6 addressing methods. Now very rapidly, you know that in IPv6 we have link local address, we can do a manual assignment in subscriber networks, in ISP networks. So 
static assignment, manual assignment of subscriber assignment is very inefficient for an ISP with 100 to 200. Well, but once you have 100,000 subscribers, you cannot even use an Excel spreadsheet. And this is information that no person can read and update and route manually. It's most inefficient. But of course, this exists. I really have come across some ISPs that do manual addressing. And it is even normal in the initial stages because there is not so much knowledge. That is why we organize all these webinars so that we learn more and more about the best practices. We can hear the recommendations to see how we go about a scalable provisioning system. And much in the same way you do a 10, 10 subscriber network, you can have one for 1 million subscribers. And this should be rap rapid and efficient. Then we have DHCP in version six. The advantage is that the DHCP can even be stateless. Normally it is stateful, but it could be stateless in the case of some options. Now we will see that the pure DHCP for IPv6 is not very useful. It can be used for the prefixes. So I will show you in a while an extension of DHCP. There's another method, which is RA, the route advertising. I will speak to this in a while. The privacy addresses, which is 100% automatic. And you might not know, but all the OSs have this, all the CPEs have this already. Well, they don't really need much privacy. And finally, a new method, this is new in IPv6, which is DHCP v6 prefix delegation. So I will refer to this right now. And of course, the possibility of doing relay. Now you will see why relay is very important. It becomes an important element in most of the cases. Let me also remind you that when I set up a one in a device, this can be done manually. In, pra in practice, it's most inefficient to do this manually. It can be IP over Ethernet with static DHCP, and now we include RA, and it could also be PPPOE. In this webinar, I'm going to speak, I'm not going to speak about PPPOE. I have my specific opinion on this, but this is a topic for another webinar. If you have any question regarding what we're going to do with IPv6 for PPPOE, is perfectly deployable. You can write to me and I will leave you my email, but due to time constraints, I will only be referring and I will be doing the demo with IP over Ethernet and not with PPPOE. Now, having said this, we have referred to some concepts involved that the major things that we have to solve in IPv6 in order to do provisioning of an access network. And remember that we have thousands of subscribers and each subscriber should be able to have the networks they wish. Now, let us do a brief review. This mechanism known as RA exists ever since we have IPv6, if I'm not mistaken. And this is quite basic in IPv6, but let us have a look at it once again. It is known as a router advertisement. And the purpose of router advertisement is having a method that all devices connected to the same network segment or in the same VLAN should be able to use this mechanism in order to discover the presence of a router and do three main things. One, to obtain from that router a prefix and assign an addressing. That is a main objective. 
And the other one is to obtain some parameters from that assignments like lifetime, the priority, and to understand that the announcement of that prefix is a router and that router can become the link, the portal to the internet. And finally, to use this mechanism in order to then make the same router much in the same way as the, the prefix is announced, the slash 64, it can also announce some options like the DNS and some other parameters required for connectivity to the internet. Now, the RA also has something that is quite interesting because this goes under the table, but it's quite interesting and it only, only happens in IPv6. Namely, it also gives the MAC address when it provides the prefix. So in the same RA, you're submitting the MAC address. So the client receiving the prefix knows the router, knows the addressing, sets up the IP, has a DNS, and it also has the MAC address. It does not have to solve the neighbor discovery or the neighbor solicitation in order to figure out the MAC address. In the past, was done with the RP in IPv4. And IPv6, this takes place automatically. So basically, the router then is set up in the interface in such a way that it can submit within every a given period of time at least one prefix that it will announce. In this case, if you look over here, I have it over here. So imagine you're going to announce in that interface prefix 2001 DB8 11 cafe 6 slash 64. So you say, well, with this interface, it can be a physical interface, it can be a VLAN, it can be a bridge, a VLAN container. So you can set this up, you can set up the prefix, you can also set up a DNS prefix or the domain name. And then this router sends a packet, a multicast packet using the multicast properties at the Ethernet and the IP address. And it then submits this information. This is part of the ICMP version six architecture So the ICMP messages are part of ICP6, and this is inseparable, insoluble. So this message is announced. This is what we know as a router advertisement. And the devices can also send out a solicitation message asking the router to submit this information. The objective is that the devices receive this prefix and using several mechanisms and the privacy assignment addresses, then take this prefix and set up an IP address that has to be unique. It, they can use a MAC address or some um, ciphered mechanism so that each has a router and domain name and so on. So the idea is to automate the entire process. So what we do is that we use these mechanisms to provide addressing to the one interface of the CPE. So in order to make this work, both the server and the interface and the clients, in this case, the CPE, have to have enabled that the RA can be transmitted and that these can be received and then processed. This is not a process that all devices have enabled automatically. Some yes, but others not. In the case of the CPE, this RE is very important. Not just uh, for uh, obtaining a prefix and configuring the IP. We, we already saw that the, the GUA IP that the CPE could have here is optional. But here, uh, 
it's it's good because the RA when when the CPE receives the uh, RA, they already know who the link local address of its router are. So it's two things that are important. So that is, in a nutshell, the RA mechanism. It's worth saying that it is the most uh, popular mechanism in the addressing uh, in, in, and the distinguished thing. And it is to be highlighted that it is stateless. And the disadvantage of this method to configure uh, one um, uh, interfaces is that as it is stateless, I have no logs. So if I want to use that IP for managing the CPE, I can't do it because I know that an IP was assigned, but I don't know which it is unless it's a, I have something to back it. It is true that if I'm going to use that for management, I could use the HCP, the HCP uh, V6 because that is uh, um not stateless so i could go to a state and get the ip address and be able to manage it so you have those two extremes state and stateless the automation efficiency and the use of more resources okay so let's stay with our, this ra for addressing here you see the addressing of the one interface of the CPE. We do it with R8. We put a slash 64 prefix in the uh, router service VLAN and a slash 64 is worth for billions of CPEs. In Gipon, as we have the client divided by ports, it's a good technique. It's not the only one, but it's a good technique to do a VLAN per on port or, or card or LP or service. And as there's a VLAN for each uh, PON port, then I have a slash 64 for each PON port. I put RA and I have a slash 64 for a pair 128 clients. And it's very efficient, but I, I'm stateless but it operates quite well. So somehow we have clearly understood the issue of RA for the interface. Let's go to the second uh, uh, topic that's a bit more complex, that it is the prefix delegation. So all this here, here I'm going to try to explain thoroughly what prefix delegation is all about. I know that some of you know it, but if you don't, this brief description, I hope it helps you in your first steps when deploying IPv6 in GPON networks and a prefix delegation is absolutely essential to deploy, to, to implement it. I recommend you to do a laboratory first. There are many prefix uh, delegator uh, servers, Huawei, Cisco, Linux, any router has prefix delegation today. And there's a lot of information about it. So all this in the provider network, this is the access unit. We have already seen it's uh, transparent. Here we have the provisioners who provides, who provisions a router, a, a Linux server, a Microtik, Juniper. You have to validate that a device at a VLAN has the capacity of being a DHCP server of uh, this version and uh, in, in um, IPv6. And, and the objective is to be able to give this CPE a set, and this, this word is very important, a set, a group of prefixes of slash 64. And here I'm going to stop. What is a set? One, I'm going to give each CPE a slash 64. I'm going to give the CPE two slash 64. Four slash 64. 256 slash 64. And I'm going to give the CPE 
65,000 slash 64, any of those uh, versions is valid. Cualquiera de esas opciones. Hay muchas opiniones ahí. Many. There are many opinions there. Es que usted le dé al CPE. The important thing is that you should give the CPE as many prefixes as you believe that the client will, will use. You have to sort of standardize it. For instance, I'm of the opinion that you have to give more slash uh, uh, 58, uh, 48. No, some people say it's too, too many prefixes that they won't use and they're going to use one or two. That's, there's even a webinar by Alejandro Acosta. Alejandro, if you have the link of that webinar of the size of the prefixes available, put it there, that would be very good. There others that think it should be slash 56 but the, uh, the aim of the delegation is that if the one that deploys gives the prefix to the cpe and the cpe makes it available for clients network, of course so they use one an interface or the client with ra and dhsp uh, may receive it and the pc the cpe there may have an IP of a prefix of the group of the prefixes. So it works like that. For instance, I give 65,000 prefixes. I assign them to the CPE. The CPE receives and takes one and puts it in the interface. And there you have it. And with that prefix, the users provision and get connected. And all the rest of the prefixes are not used at the beginning. But when the user wants to use them, they're available. I can provision another interface and another Wi-Fi network, etc. May route uh, prefixes to the uh, LAN, next LAN of the client. Alejandro, you, can you still hear me well? Yes, yes, perfectly. Good. I hope I'm not going too fast. Please let me know if I'm going too fast or too slowly. Uh, you are going at a good pace, but I remind you that we've already gone for one hour and eight minutes good so it's necessary to provision the network of the uh, uh, client with slash 64 prefixes uh, delivered by a server in the control network of a client and this is called delegation the delegation is the procedure through which a server gives a cp upon request a group of prefixes that are called the delegated prefixes so they say ah, here you are use the prefixes it's a set of slash 64 and it is also important that after delegating the prefixes they must be duly routed so let's get into that discussion how does it work that is simple in the same domain you have client and server there's transparency here, here there are transportation networks, the tunnels, uh, the OLP, the GPOM, or the DHCP, and the CPE are in the same unit. The CPE sends a, a solicit, a, a solicit of a delegated prefix, and the server identifies in that the I, the ID, uh, the, the server receives it, assesses it, authenticates it. There you have uh, the, uh, the work. Um, and so when they respond, they say, you know what? The prefix that you've been assigned is such and such and assigns a due prefix. So the CPE receives it. And now you're going to see what the process, how the process goes. Only one minute to see the history of this delegation. Initially, we had the GBHCP version 6 in the RFC 3315 version. So in, a, in a, another RFC, we had the delegation that was RFC 3633. And further on, they decided to put the delegation of DH the HCP version 6, because the delegation is an additional option 
Uh, so it, it is in the same protocol. So now everything is summarized in technical terms in RFC 8415. So the prefix delegation is the same, the DHCP version six, but handling the delegation as an extension in terms of options, as, as well as a, as a DHCP client may request uh, domain name, um, a DNS server. Now they're going to request to solicit a delegated prefix. So if you are a DHCP V6 uh, client, you only ask for a delegated um, prefix. So you have all the rest of possibility of having a relay, uh, have a UDP based uh, messages, then scope multicast. So I, I won't get into the technical details, but let us now discuss the delegated prefixes. As I said, those prefixes may be from slash 48 to slash 64. If you delegate slash 64, you are delivering a prefix. If you are uh, um, delivering a 60, uh, you are uh, given many 16 more. But the, the idea is that who, who can solicit prefix delegation? Any CP. All the CPs that I know, GPON, or even Microtech, Gabriel Lincoln, any others, all that I've seen in the last five years may solicit delegated prefixes. And then with those delegated prefixes, they can do whatever they want. The delegated prefixes go hand in hand with, uh, um, they have a lifetime because these are stateful um, delegations. They assign the prefix for some time, then they can renew it, they can uh, remove it, uh, etc. So let's see hands -on, some hands-on examples. Here you have a chart where you can see when you are going to assign something, you have three levels. Let's see it first here. The first thing that you define is a base, uh, a baseline prefix that is a large prefix that contains the prefixes that are going to be delegated, then we have the delegated prefixes that it's each one contained in the baseline. Um, and then here we have all the slash 64. So with this concept, you're going to understand this table very well. If you define a slash 60 prefix and you're going to deliver a slash 64, it's, the arithmetic is very easy. There are 16 prefixes delegated and each of them has one slash 64 prefix. Let me give you two or three examples for the sake of time. Let's assume that I take a slash 52 for a slash 56. That means that the base, base uh, prefix 50 slash 54 to when they request a solicit a delegation, I'm going to deliver a slash 56. So if you do the arithmetic, and they say, well, how many slash 56 are there in a slash 52? 16. If you want to have a quick formula, you subtract 56 minus 52, and each of those, each slash 56, how many slash 64? Well, 64 minus 56. So from a slash 52, you get 16 slash 56 prefixes. Each of them has 256. So it's very important for you to sign this well for the size of the base prefix and the size of the delegated prefix. Because if I have a slash 52 to slash 56, and the question is, how many clients can I give prefixes to? It's 16. If that network you have 50 uh, clients, it's not good. So you have to look for the proper a uh, combination, for instance, this combination, um, 4856 is very good because I can provision 256 VPEs and, and each of them will receive a slash 56. So this matches very well with GPON because typically there are 128 clients. The recommendation too is multiply in multiples. You could, you, you could assign a slash 57, but my recommendation, and I think that many at LACME too, is to use the nibbles and to work with slash 
48, 52, 56, 64. And if you're going to go beyond and we delegated many clients, you can use a slash 44, 40, 36, not, not slash 32 because it's the entire prefix. ¿Cuántos delegadores necesito? Y cada so in this case, you have many, you have to delegate and to how many clients and the size of the delegated prefixes that I have to deliver. Initially, it looks a bit complex, but after doing a couple of exercises, you realize it is quite simple. Let me give you an example so that you can see how a delegation is used or a delegated prefix. Let us assume that I select a base prefix slash 48. 2001 DB8 CAV 0000 slash 48. Now, normally, doing a delegation splitting a slash 48 is a good idea to start. And from that slash 48, I'm going to deliver slash fix five, six prefixes. The first question is the number of prefixes available to be delegated. Very simple. To do the six. 56 minus 48. You're going to learn this by heart afterwards. It's 256 possible prefixes, the first, the second, the third, until 256. And each has 256 slash 64. So you start with a disaggregation. The first delegated prefixes. Well, the largest number of servers deliver this in increasing number. The first one is the first of the series, the second, the second, another series, the third, and so on. Not like some DHCPs, which do, is in, do it in the opposite direction. Now, the first prefix is 2001 DB8 CAF, and the first would be, well, let me remind you. Here, this is why I included this with a larger this, um, font. I'm going to deliver a slash five, six. I'm going to move these two over here. I can move these two from zero, zero up to FF and each delegated prefix varies here. So the first delegated prefix, 2000 DB8, CAF, zero, 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 zero. And the first slash six, four is zero, 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 one, etc. The second delegated prefix, you'd put the zero, one over here. So it'd be 0100, that would be the slash 64, and then the second one, and so on. Once again, for those of you who are looking at, at this topic of the delegation for the first time, I can assure you that after two or three exercises, this does become something quite straightforward. This is a further example with details explaining this engineering. An ISP normally receives a slash 32, and we have all the bits from 32 to slash 64 to play around, to do the addressing plan, and so on. So what I would recommend is that within the addressing plan, which is a very important part of all the process, to consider reserving prefixes for the delegation. So that the prefixes are in sequence. Because the delegations are done sequentially, you don't have any overlapping. This here shows an example of a slash 40, a slash 48 over here, or a slash 48 and a slash 56. And this is an example of a slash 36 to slash 48. So this is just for the purpose of having information on the topic. And finally, but not least important, is that I give a prefix to the CPE, the CPE, which is in the subscriber's home, under the TV set on um, Avenue X of the city X receives, that person receives a prefix and that prefix should be reachable by a host located in China, in Japan, in the United States, in Argentina, Peru, wherever. So 
An important detail of this process is that delegated prefix routing normally was not resolved by the one serving the prefixes. In other words, some years ago, I recall that I set up a lab, one of the first labs I ever set up regarding prefix delegations. I discovered that these were delegated but were not routed. The prefix reaches the CPE, the CPE is set up, it does the trusting, but it does not have internet. And this is because what is the point of delivering the prefix if it is not routed? So this did become a, quite an issue. And the first versions of MicroTix 6.20 that include delegation in the support did not route the delegated prefix. This was then corrected by MicroTix and they do routing. Huawei does not do routing, but it does through with Relay. I just have one very brief topic before we go to the demo. This is the ONT. So if we enter the ONT as if, as if it's like the CPE, what do we see inside? It's not part of the chip on course, but the ONT becomes a CPA insofar as I instruct it that it will be routing traffic. It was separating the one network from the client's network. And the ONT, when routing the traffic and performing as a CPE, in the ONT will have a router. And this is a router that I will do provisioning with. It has a WAN interface that has then a client VLAN and all the GPON structure is set up. And those and then it is commuted in the OLT. The OLT does the switching. And this allows traffic from the CPE to go through a GPON network to reach the OLT. The OLT delivers this to the client's network. So this part over here does the provisioning to this router over here. But in the middle, between one and the other, you have a whole set of elements, some of which can participate and others not. So this is a concept I wanted to reinforce. So Alejandro, we have now concluded with the theoretical part. We we'll go on to the practical part. Maybe you'd like to summarize some of the questions that came up regarding this first part. Any questions before we go into the demo? Yes, we have several questions. I'm going to try and organize these, you have at least seven questions. Alexandra Palmar Gomez says, good morning, I have a question. With a 10 pawn card, the S ASP SPF on the ONT side would be 10 gigabits in the same way? Well, that's a good question. Let me find the slide so that I can specifically answer that question over here. So if you have a 10 GPON, this port over here, the ONT port that views this network has to be 10 GPON. It has to be X GPON. So an ONT that is GPON cannot receive 10 GPON traffic. Now, if the question is, this port over here, port A towards a client, can, can be done through the Ethernet or also 10 gigabit internet. And what normally the ONTs have is Gen B PON to the client side to deliver a large amount of traffic. And these have been set up to deliver large capacity. And this Board here has to be 10 GPON. So if you have a client and you wish to shift to 10 GPON, you have to change the ONT. Let's go up to, on to the second question. From Edwin Limachi. I heard that the Prefixes on the client side have to be slash 48, but I see here that have to be 64, which is the best practice. 
Let me link this to the another question that we have done by Mr. Morillo. He says that is there a best practices, are the best practices to define the dimensioning of a slash 36 or slash 48 with the intention of assigning a, an IPv6 segment that is adequate for the clients and while maintaining the reservations on the internal use, respectively? Well, we have to recall that when we do provisioning of the client's network in IPv6, this network we have over here, let me use this slide here, this one we have over here, then you do not direct, do not do direct provisioning. What you do is provisioning to the CPE and then the CPE does provisioning with a set of prefixes, for example, a slash 60. So you might say, I need to give the CPE a slash 60, the CPE receives the slash 60, which are 16 slash 64 prefixes. Let me take this example here. And from those 16 prefixes, the CPE takes in principle one of those, normally the first one. And with that slick slash 64, it is then placed on this interface over here, number one, for example. So on the client side, the client always sees a slash 64. But what reached the CPE are N slash 64s. It could be, have been 16, it could have been 40, 32, 156, or even 65,000. That doesn't matter. So if the question was, once they, how many reach the CPE? The CPE receives n number of slash 64s, many or a few, or maybe just one. But these reach the CPE and the CPE, and when we see the demo, you'll see this clearly. It takes one of those slash 64s and puts in that one interface. And this is how the client has access to the internet with one slash 64. If the client then wishes to have another one and another one more and to route one and the other and have a network of 1,000 networks, this is something that the client will be able to do insofar as the CP has received as many slash 64 prefixes as requested by that client. Now, at this stage, one is enough for that client. Now, let me go on to the second part of the question. I think this answers the first part of the question regarding best practices. Let's have a look here. To go directly to the point, best practices says deliver to the CPE anything between slash 48 and slash 56. In other words, if I now take 100 experts, We have Alejandro Costa and many experts that we have here. And I say, how many would you deliver in terms of delegation? And I then do the statistics. I would say that the curve states that the largest number will say between slash 48 and slash 56. It might not seem very common to have people who say that it is a best practice to still have more than a slash 56. Now I have come across some that say with slash 64, this is enough. A slash 64 is out of proportion. You let me to deliver 256 prefixes is only one will be used. But when you contrast that with LACNIC's best practices at state, think that the client might grow so much that you cannot even imagine then it is preferable that ahead of time that have as many prefixes as possible. And then you also have other causes, aggregation, routing that the client might have and the nuts. So the best practice states that delegation between slash 48 and slash 56 could be, and some people might wish to have a slash 60. So a slash 36, is not a very good practice because it would be too much. I think that between slash 48 and slash 56 as delegated prefix. 
is fine. Now, if you get to deliver slash 48, the base prefix has to be a slash 40, for example. B has a base prefix from which the delegated prefixes stem. I think this answers the question on best practices. Now, there are very many opinions here, and nobody has the absolute truth. That was a good uh, final comment. Another question. We still have the demo. William Usinha. According to your experience, for one authentication in the CPE, what mechanism is that? A PPP, OE, DCP, DHCP, IP, OA. 100% DHCP. And this is very clear cut answer because PPP OE has two things. One, or rather three that are against this. One is that it overloads the system more than the DHCP because of the state it maintains. Secondly, it suggests a further element of action regarding provisioning. And this is a user's password for the PPPOE, and this is really pointless. And thirdly, because the PPPOE is very sensitive to time synchronization. In other words, if the CPE, he corrects himself, if the OLDT is not synchronized, there might be a disconnection. So this is a far sense, more sensitive protocol. Now with the PPPOE, is that many used PPPOE in IPv4 because of the issue of having more IP requests than required. And it might seem natural that if you had PPPOE, then that it you would continue with PPPOE. But I encourage you to conduct analysis of these three elements that I just mentioned, which might play against this. And I might be inclined to opt for DHCP, even if you have to invest some more time in that change. But once again, I repeat, this is my opinion. Nobody has the final opinion. And I'm sure that there are many ISPs that have PPPOE, and this works perfectly well. But if I set this up, I do it in this way. So do we have a, a PPPOE with RA? R Flores asks, hello. Since what here has DHCP has been uh, um, available, it's to validate my equipment to see whether it uh, is supported. I am very bad at dates, but I can tell you two things. I think that it started in 2016 and then uh, 2018. It's it's uh, not less than five six years. So, but here if I put the RFC. It's RFC 3633 and then RFC 8416. And then if you look at look it up, you'll see the year. But I think it's six to, to eight, not less than that. Fortunately, all the routers, Microtech has it since 6.2 and then 6.4, 6 something. Uh, so we have Marcos Pereira, and and uh, when uh, when the client resets uh, CPE, uh, is it delegated another prefix? Very good question. The 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 process of CPD. Let's not forget that it's the same HTTP process, so it's connected. So the server uh, keeps uh, the uh, request. Uh, so when the client uh, solicits, it solicits again, but as uh, the server is uh, faithful, the identifier doesn't change unless the interface or the MAC address have changed. So the server assigns the same prefix. One of the most uh, common practices uh, that exist today is that the clients or indeed will receive traditionally the same prefix. It's not like in the IPv4 world, usually 
it took a certain time and then it expired, etc. So here, is this the same? Is it possible to delegate a prefix a, a of a client static? Yes, yes, it's possible. And I'm going to show you. Yes, the only thing is, remember, I've always told you this webinar, your provisioning system will be successful if you provision 1 million users. If you are prepared to take uh, the registry of uh, 1 million addresses as with 10, then you're successful. Now, if when you have 1,000, it, it is co that's complicated, then it, it's not scalable. And then, well, this is the last question. Carlos Gonzalez is asking, can I use the same VLAN of service that I currently use for IPv4 to send a HTTP PV client and through the same service to VLAN to use the Slack to assign IPv6 in the one? That's a good question. Very good question. And really, I love these webinars in Latin America because here we see top level people with very, very interesting questions. I'm so, so grateful for this question. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Normally, that's the way you do it. The same VLAN that is uh, giving, providing IPv4 will provide IPv6. However, in the new generation OLTs, actually, the more advanced OLTs, such as the top five, Huawei, uh, Nokia, Calix, etc they make it possible at the OLT level in layer two to decouple the traffic for IPv4 and IPv6 in different VLANs. That's a practice that is possible, but it is not too striking because it suggests two VLANs, double attention, you need more expertise, but it is possible to handle it in two different VLANs. And in the CPE2, you can do an interface one for IPv4 and one for IPv6, and you handle them from the CPE in different VLANs. I think, why, why did I say that I like the question? Because it's an excellent question for our lab and to test those reactions. So the answer is yes, you can both handling the same VLAN and separate VLAN, and it's an excellent exercise to learn a lot about um, provisioning and GPON. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So, Carlos, thank you. Well, Carlos has another comment. Actually, it's a question. And he says, that I'm going to highlight one of the uh, pictures that you Carlos Gonzalez says, either one, could you then apply in the one, could you apply Slack RA, but you could assign private IPv6, um, a private uh, quote unquote, uh, speaking of Agua, prefix, unique, uh, in a unique local address and a EULA or similar to the private IPv4 in a, in an IPv6 world that basically is prefix FC00. So let, I'm going to say this, what Jose, because Jose has said that in the one with RA, the CPE would be able to configure uh, LAN. And, but there are many practices and Jose, please go on. Well, they recommend emphatically to put the provisioning of the one may be through DHCP. With Slack, it works, it will work, but it's out of security control, monitoring the state. You mentioned that DHCP keeps the state. So, well, these are practices that several vendors and IETF recommend. So, um, this is the Dula and uh, with DHCP assigning um, DHCP in the LAN. The delegation 
let me say something about the delegation has the advantage provisioning of the clients and network has the advantage that you don't have many choices it's either delegation or delegation because doing it statically is very inefficient but on the issue of provisioning of the one network of the cpe there are several options and you have slack and dhp Okay, so we compare things rapidly. The advantage of Slack is very fast and can be done by the same router that does routing. And now it occurs that it doesn't maintain state, so it doesn't know which IP was assigned to the CPE unless it knows the MAC address. Now, if you go to the other end, which is using DHCP, you have the state and you can do tracking and so on and ping and even enter the OLT, but it has the disadvantage that the state softens the performance of the router or the device. He has muted his microphone somehow. Some, something is wrong. You maintain the device and many devices and maintain the, and do routing and so on. So this might play against you now. If provisioning is done centralized by a BNG or a more powerful device, then definitely state is very useful because the device has been prepared to handle many devices or many device devices. So you have to put those two things to do the, to consider the two options. So when people start out and are more concerned about delegation, they put RA because they don't need it at the beginning, but then they need to do IPv6 management. So they say, well, let's go to DHCP, but they remove this from the router and include this in a separate device in the same VLAN. So that's the element. So very much for your answer. Now, part of your answer was not heard. Something happened with your audio. Apparently, you went on mute and we couldn't listen to that part of the answer. So do you think you could once again repeat your answer but in a summarized way yes of course i was saying that in the prefix delegations you don't have so many options you delegate or you don't delegate prefixes and the one interface of the cpa you have ra you have the slack or ghcp version six on one end you have the ra which is most efficient and it's very fast, any device supports this, and it's most efficient if you place it in the same access router. It has a disadvantage that because it is stateless, it is not traceable, so you cannot manage it. And on the other hand, you have DHCP v6, which does provide traceability, is stateful, and help, is helpful in network management. But if it's going to be deployed in the same device where you have the router is going to affect your performance because it is stateful. So it is suggested to use DHCP if you have this in a separate device than the access router or if it has been prepared to do this type of process. And these are the two extremes. So, well, Jose, we have 16 minutes left. Let's go over to the practical part. And if we have time, we can come back to the questions that we still have at hand. So let's go over to the practice. First of all, let me show you how to set up an ONT, a CPE, a GPON, 10 GPON in this case. And the ONTs have many ways in which they can be set up. This can be done through the web or to a zero or nine XML or through the OLT, OMSI. 
So I'm going to use a very simple setup because what I would like you to see is what we set up at the IPv6 in the CP in this case. This is a Huawei. Now, the advantage of this, you might have realized, is that it includes native IPv6 support. Now, if you pay attention, I can access with a link local address. I don't know if you can see here all the Huawei ONTs, all the ones I have seen so far, in fact, have this option over here. So any PC you use, works and you don't need to do the, all the setup. So this is quite cool. Now we need to set up the ONT with this mechanism. Let me go directly to the points um, we are going to focus on. First of all, in the ONT, you have to do the following. ONTs can be configured in layer two or layer three. You can indicate to be configured as a bridge or as a router. And in each port, this can be done independently. But I want this ONT in layer three. The first thing I have to state is that it, for all the ports, I would like to have layer three. So all the routers, all the ports should be connected to a router. I'm going to set this up here on the one. And basically, I check the port. It interprets that that port is part of a router that acts as a P. If I don't put a check in this box, then that port is a bridge. So I will receive provisioning there because there's no one interface. Now, secondly, you have to set up the one interface. So I'm going to set up this interface over here. Well, the, this is what the CPE routers use to the IP world, and I want to focus on the main parameters. Let me focus on a couple of things. First, you have to enable, enable one. We have to state that this is a router because you can even have a switch in some more advanced configurations. It can even switch, but this is not the case today. And here, this is in gray. I can even state that it should be dual stack or IPv4 only or IPv6 only. In this case, I'm going to state that it should be IPv6 only. This is a good exercise of setting up the first ONTs in IPv6 only, because I don't want to go into IPv4, first of all, and also for time constraints. I indicate the service type and then what VLAN is going to be used for the traffic. Imagine it is VLAN from the ONT. So we're going to work with the VLAN 266. And so far, I haven't said anything about IPv6, just that the interface is IPv6 only. I associate the ports on the LAN side, LAN 1, LAN, LAN 2, and so on. And down here, we have the provisioning. Imagine that all provisioning will have, let me enlarge my screen so you can view this better. So you will note that in a WAN interface of the CPE, you will have two things, prefix acquisition mode. So how do I obtain the prefixes? There are three options. Option one is none, option two, static, as was mentioned by the colleague in the question. If I indicate statically, I'm going to say which are the prefixes that will be assigned. But this is not our case because it would be most efficient. I'm going to say no. The prefix will be obtained through delegation. So you're going to obtain this with DHCP v6 with PD in the, this VLAN. So when this is set up, it's going to start asking for the prefixes. And hopefully, they have a server to announce this. And then independently, Separate, separately, we have IP acquisition mode. And here I have the two things that was mentioned. I want it to be obtained through DHCP or automatically. Automatically means RA. So you have this over here to obtain this through RA. So I'm going to do this in this way because I did the lab with RA. 
and not JCPP6. Para DSLA y no sé el caso. And, y eso and, todo... even has... and well, and that's the only thing I have to do in the interface. So what happens? I'm going to put apply and that uh, ONT will start working. And I want you to see, I, I want to see the complete process. I go to status, I go to one. There are other optical parameters that need to be configured, but I want you to see that the ONT, let me validate that, let me enter the OLT and let me activate the service. Just a second, I am in the OLT, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate the service. I had deactivated it because I wanted you to see the process. So we're going to activate the service. So think. I want you to realize that the ONT, as soon as I configured it in interface one, it already connected in the VLI 266 and got two things separately. Here it's telling me, it tells me prefix obtained. Here you have the prefix. It's a slash 56, if you notice it. I'm going to speak of that slash 56. And on the other hand, it got an IPv6 address. It doesn't say it, but it's a slash 64. That is the router announced these prefix. I'm going to show it. And uh, the OP, uh, uh, and it generated an address. So it has the one, a prefix. And I want to stop here for a second because until now, the ONT obtained one prefix, but that's not enough. I need from that prefix to obtain one slash 64. What do I do that? Well, I'm going to hit go here in configuration here to land, and I'm going to go here to the HCP version 6.0. So look at this. It says interface address information. And it puts a link local address. And an interesting thing. The ONT of the land site doesn't need uh, uh, because the routing is through the link address. The ONT needs a slash 64 to deliver it to clients, not for himself. So it says, how do I get the prefixes? So I say, well, know what? Uh, take the prefixes from one uh, agent. Uh, which one? One, two, six, six, because there could be several. But even if it says, oh, but of those prefixes there that I know that it's a slash 56, do you want me to take the first or do you want me to take some of them? And the ONT allows that through a prefix mask, you can say, which of all the prefixes, the derivation prefixes you want to take. So what, here I told it to take the third. I, actually, it's the fourth because the first is zero. The second is one, the third is two, and the fourth is three. And so from here, it takes a DNS and comes through RA and presents it to the customers at uh, RA level and at the DHCP level. That is, it takes one of the prefixes that ones that you got, and presents it to the clients here, presents it to the client using RA and DHCP. DHCP. So let's see the result of that. The result of that is that the PC that's here has a, uh, an addressing. Before I show you that addressing, I want you to see that in the one, I want you to see the prefix. Let's see it again. So could, if you can learn it by heart for a second, uh, here, this one, uh, 2803721010, that's a delegated prefix. So let me see the state, and we're going to try and see 
the addresses it took. No. That's... So we can take it here. For a right, uh, so right uh, key. Uh, here you see the addressing of a client. Look at this here. The addressing the client obtained. If you look at this, this is the delegated prefix. 28, et cetera, et cetera. And of the, this entire prefix, it took slash 64, number three. This three here, it's a three I, I showed you initially. Let me see whether I can expand this. And then you see slash 64, well, you see, now the client has an IP address. So look, it's an IP address of a slash 64 taken from a delegated prefix, delivered from a base uh, prefix. And the objective was met, that is that the client's PC or smartphone or tablet or whatever the device may have that IP address. That address can be reached and you even uh, generate a privacy IP address, uh, this is the link, um, this is the local address. So I wanted to show you this here, but as we don't have much time, let me go directly because I want you to see the provisioning. Very quickly, in two minutes, let me show you this. Allow me 30 seconds to connect. Uh huh. 6.515. Now I'm going to the Huawei router. Here I have it, here, there you are. Here. Look, I want you to see. This is a router Huawei, and that means I'm going to show you. In VLAN 266, the provisioning, basically. There's an IPv4 addressing. There's an IPv6 addressing. Alejandro, can you see that size well? I can see it. Yeah. Here you can see the IPv6 addressing. Think that it is from this addressing that I, I want you here to see uh, slash 64. This is the prefix. Of announced by RA. Look at it in the ONT. This ONT is the same, 2803-72109-FFFFFFFD is the same one here. That ONT obtained that addressing through this RA. Here it is. How do I activate uh, the RA in the router, very simple. The only command that you need is this one because it comes, um, uh, it is uh, disabled by default. You just need to put the prefix as well, 64, configure the time parameters. I put the DNS. I take, these are the DNFs that I'm going to send through RA. All this is RA in a VLAN interface. And that VLAN interface is connected to a switch, the switch is connected to the ONT, and the result is that the ONT obtained an addressing. It even got the RAs. I don't know whether you realized that the PC has the DNS, those DNS is there. Config. The DNS has reached the client. The DNS is out there. I showed them. They're further up. 
So those DNSs are configured here. Just a minute to show you the delegation. What happens? What I've done, I want to show you two things. One, let me go here again so that you may see the prefix again. Just let me show you the delegated prefix here. I want you to see the delegated prefix. It will take me two minutes. This is the delegated. So we're going to see it here, 9FFF, et cetera. Basically what I've done is to say that in that VLAN, do a relay and I send the uh, DHCP solicitude to a remote server and I say, this command is essential. I want you to see the routing of the delegated display, IPv6, routing table. And I want you to see that in the routing table, in the router, I want you to see the delegated prefix. It's this one here. This is a route slash 56. And do you know what this address is? It's the IP address of the interface point. This is the delegated prefix uh, routing. If that routing is not here, I can't see it. That is, this router delegated, gave the prefix and added a route in its routing table, without which there's no internet for required. And finally, here I show the delegation is sent to a relay and say all the DHCP, DHCP requests go to the relay. That's a macritic. So here you have it, uh, the pool, the pool slash 48. This is the pool from which I took that slash 56. It uh, is given a prefix of the first, and here you have the delegation, VLAN 12. Here you don't have the VLAN because it, it was set. And notice that here we have the state. This is the state. This is the prefix, and it says who it was given to. Um, the um, D that has the information of uh, the MAC address, and here you have the state. And so basically, that is the process. And here there was a document where this it was described step by step. I don't know where Alejandro can publish it somewhere so that you may receive that. The GPON configuration and the configuration of the delegation in Huawei and Macritic. The interesting thing, and with this I close, is that if you do a DHCP here, the router delegates but does not route the prefix that is why normally we need to do a relay because incredibly enough the relay uh, uh, does, doesn't uh, route the route the DHCP alone so with this i would be closing i would have liked some additional minutes but i think that the aim was met final reflections uh, there, do things, put your labs together, talk to the vendors for IPv6, uh, assemble a pilot uh, a network, um, attend any courses where you can learn more, um, go to, uh, to the lab, ask questions, uh, answer them, ask, and as you can say, go forward because there's a lot of work to do. And very technical the terms delegation is the practical uh, 48 to slash 56 that are most common then you have uh, the considerations uh, well and that's all start working thank you for coming i hope that we could uh, transmit enough uh, so get going start testing and start moving in the IPv6 and GPON worlds. That's the future. 
So, so have a nice holy week, and I want to thank Laknik with all their team that always gives us a chance to communicate. Alejandro, Sandra, the entire team, I'm missing people. Thank you, have a nice day, have a nice holy week. Alejandro, I think there were questions. Yes, but we, we have only two minutes. Well, put the, the uh, mail in. I'm going to put together three questions, basically, in one they talk of a person that has three prefixes in their network, and another person asks if you have a slash 48 assigned by LACNIG, how would you provision it? And what I want to say with this, in the video that we showed of IPv6 addressing plan, there they answer these questions. If you received a slash 48 of LACNIG, you can follow the procedure that was said, and you're going to have an excellent GP on network, uneventful. And on the balancing of the three, the speed, which is that's a more EGP or other traffic engineering mechanism rather than proficient provisioning. And the other question, Juan pointed out, is that a mechanism to translate the border to be Well, the mechanism, there are several. Jose mentioned a couple of them, uh, 464X lab. He mentioned the C, and we can mention that but that's a very long issue that I don't want to discuss now. Now, just two questions, Jose, one minute per question maximum. What would happen? Imagine that uh, the, uh, uh, if they start putting routers behind, what would happen? Um, uh, that's a very good question. In IPv6, when you have several providers, balancing is not so simple because as in IPv6, there's no NAT. It's mandatory almost for your prefix to be announced. That is why in IPv6, as, as just as uh, requesting your prefix, you have to announce it. And that in IPv4, that's a problem that didn't exist for the end user. But in IPv6, if you're going to use your prefix and not your providers, you have to announce them. So we have to um, work with that a bit to announce your prefixes so that you're going to be able to use it with no problem. And the question is, what happens if you put our, a router behind the ONT? Well, the ONT receives a delegation let's say a slash 56 and that is 256 prefixes that router behind if they have ra or http client they will be able to re receive um, addressing as if it were a user but they won't be able to route uh, the traffic behind that router if they want to do it fortunately all the ONTs, all of them any vendor can uh, is capable of doing routing. So if you want to assign one or several slashes 64 of the ones that you receive from, from ONT to a router behind, you get into the ONT, I wanted to, to show you. All the ONTs have a menu where you can create routes and the most sophisticated ONTs have uh, routing protocols so you can put together the network that you want as a client precisely because you have many prefixes available you can put together and you can route and if you receive your slash 56 you can send a, a 60 not just in an in one router several routers with your same typology your servers if you have a, a network of the internet of things you can assign multiple slash 64 multiple VLANs just as you like it, no problems whatsoever. You connect the router, you route, you route uh, the prefix. It doesn't matter if all the network is coming through the um, ONT because it's coming through other provider. That's the exercise. Thank you, Jose. We won't use any more of your time. I want to thank you once again for, for LACNIC, the time that you devote to us. We hope that people may have 
liked uh, this webinar that they've understood once again we think that what we still need for deploying or implementing ipv6 in g networks is rather a will thing um so thank you sandra thank you laknik team uh, hopefully this we will repeat this sure have a nice day thank you and thank laknik i'm going to stay here for just a few seconds Thank you. Thank you. See you next time.